was uh, what was uh, what is important is the wager in this strategy. Of course, no, I think you have understood it is to separate in an action its efficacy, its effective reality from the subject that has enacted it. So let's reflect on the peculiar status of the priestly action. It is split in two. On one side, the opus operatum, its effectiveness, its reality. On the other, the opus operantis, the subjective modalities through which the agent realizes the action. The ethical link between the subject and his actions is broken. No, there is no, neither the intention nor the moral status of the agent are in any sense relevant. As the devil actions are done in the service of God, although they are in themselves wrong and rotten, in the same way the action of the priest is good and valid as Opus Dei, even if the priest is a sinner, a rascal, a murderer. I would like to underscore uh, the, the peculiar status of subjectivity in this context. Uh, the priest is just, as theologian said, a living instrument, instrumentum animatum, of a mystery that transcends him. And yet, insofar as he is a minister, he is the agent, he enacts the sacramental action that without him could not become real and effective. This paradoxical praxis is what the theologians called the officium, the office. I think you are immediately aware of the enormous influence that this practical paradigm exerted on Western culture. The, the paradigm of the holy office is the same as the paradigm of the civil office. The officer and the clergyman are just on the same uh, status. No? And there is an action which is due, which is good and efficacious in itself, with no respect for the moral status of the agent, but nevertheless the agent is essential not as a body or a person, but only insofar he has the power and the legitimation for acting. Only insofar he exerts a certain function. So you see which incredible transformation of the paradigm of human praxis which is imp implicit in this uh, model. No? There is an incredible transformation. So, uh, of, uh, but also, this implies also a huge and equal transformation in ontology. Heidegger, in his lessons, 1941 lessons on the metaphysics as the history of being, had analyzed the ontological transformation implicit in the translation of the Greek term energeia into the Latin term actualitas, which will become Wirklichkeit. Heidegger points out the Roman origin of this transformation and also mentions the Roman Church. But this indication remains vague and Heidegger limits himself to evoke, I quote, the biblical Christian faith in creation. My investigation Shows show that the first Latin translation of the Greek energia is not actualitas, which is a part of a late scholastic terminology, but effectus, efficacia, efficien efficiencia, eh? efficacy. Uh, with, with all terms which appears, and particularly the second efficacy, around the half of the third century. They are invented by Christian theology. The, the locus of the ontological transformation that will be 
inherited by the modern is not the faith in the creation, but the liturgy and the theory of sacraments. While energia was for Aristotle a mode of being, a dwelling in the presence grounded on the, mod on the model of the ergon, the work, now being becomes a wirklichkeit, a praxis, an activity, a peculiar activity, an effectuality, a praxis which coincides with its effects. It's completely changed the, mod the model of being. But I think that this is still our way of understanding what being is. We have no representation of being other than this Wirklichkeit or Realitas. And let me conclude uh, evoking the historical context in which uh, the liturgical movement was located. Mm -hmm. Is it by chance that the birth and development of the liturgical movement in the Church coincides with an unprecedented development of the liturgical and the ceremonial aspects of profane power? Thus, in the same years, we witness first in fascist Italy and then in Nazi Germany the elaboration of political rituals where the presence of a conscious liturgical element is evident. The analogy is not only formal, not only the techni technical element indispensable to every liturgy, the so-called doxology or acclamation, is retaken and reactualized by state power, but, as Kantorowicz has shown in his beautiful book on the Laudes Regie, there is an ex a continuous exchange of the acclamations between the church and the, the state power. Uh, if you know this book, Kantorowicz makes the history of an acclamation, a specific acclamation, Christus vincit, Christus regnat, Christus imperat. Uh, uh, Christ uh, wins, Christ uh, reigns, Christ uh, commands. But as soon as Pius the eleventh is elected as Pope in 1922, the same year when Mussolini takes the power in Italy, he intended to face the, the new energy in politics, uh, initiating the feast he called of Christus Rex, Christ the King, and reactualized the old doxology. But what Kantorowicz showed is very interesting that uh, a few years after we found this uh, doxology, this acclamation uh, from the church uh, shifting in the fascist uh, rituals, which will use it mixing with the name of Mussolini. They will say Christus vincit and Mussolini. <laughs> and we also find is in, by in, uh, during Spanish civil war uh, used by fascist militants, militians. But also Carl Schmitt's theory of the Führer, Führertum, eh, where the Führer is con conceived not simply as a symbol, but as enacting and realizing, I quote, the immediate presence, Gegenwart, of the German people corresponds exactly to Kassel's theory of the Mysterium Gegenwart of Christ in the sacrament. And in the first half of the 20th century, liturgy is everywhere, I think. Not only where you can expect it, like in Stefan George in Poetical Circle. Do you remember that the Christ was called Stat? <coughs> or in Ludwig Klage's Cosmische Runde, but also where you could not ex have expected it, as in Georges Bataille's group.